Hello and welcome to NewsClicks International Roundup. US President Donald Trump is in the middle of a visit to Europe and Russia and as usual has been creating a lot of chaos with his statements. On Monday, he said to meet Russian President Vladimir Putin. But ahead of that, 12 Russian intelligence officers have been indicted in the United States for attempts to interfere in the 2016 presidential elections. To talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Purkayasa. Hello, Prabir. Prabir, let's start with the indictments and the meeting of Trump and uh, Putin on Monday. So what do you make of this latest step in what's been a long probe and how, what impact will it have on the discussions? It's an interesting question, particularly as we know that people have argued this probe itself is motivated, it's meant to embarrass Trump's presidency and prevent any kind of reapproachment between the United States and Russia. It's a continuation of the policy by which uh, United States has effectively tried to isolate Russia, starting with uh, Ukraine, the Crimean issue and so on. Now, if we take that as the background, then of course this is a further attempt to drive a wedge between uh, Putin and uh, Trump and also makes Trump's ability to negotiate any kind of understanding with uh, Russia or try to lower, shall we say, the rhetoric on West Asia, on Iran, or issues of Israel, and of course issues of, uh, shall we say, the Baltic states, as well as Ukraine and other countries. So I think that is a background that it does, it could be argued, there is a deep state attempt to destabilize uh, Trump's uh, attempt to reach to any normalization with Putin. That's one part of it. Let's look at the other part, which I think is also quite interesting. The argument that Russia was trying to hack the US elections. Now, if we take hacking of elections, meaning trying to change elections of another country, then the United States is the biggest serial, of serial offender on that count. And probably no country, including UK, UK, Germany, France, has, can also say that the US didn't try to influence their elections. Adversarial terms, elections to various third world countries. Uh, there were, in fact, regime change operations tried with attempts to change the elections. We know that uh, the US has tried to uh, intervene in elections starting from Iran's Mossadegh's election. We have also its intervention in different ways in Congo, uh, which are the more blatant ones the world knows about. We have a coups and attempted regime changes in Syria starting from the 50s. So this is a very long-standing tradition of the, of the United States that they actually do destabilize elections. Forget everything else. Uh, Merkel's cell phone was tapped. Now that's very recent, not too far back. So US obviously imposes or expects a different standards from what it behaves. So it's according to it, it's perfectly natural for it to try to hegemonize world's politics by influencing other people's elections. But any intervention with US elections, assuming that Russia is really involved, would be considered a hostile act and also almost an act of war. So this is the, shall we say, the standards we see uh, that US and the uh, US public, its media, and its government, and all the agencies seem to believe in that US should be sacrosanct. And while US should have the full right to interfere in anybody else's politics. Coming to the actual issue, the DNC hack, which is really the start of all of this, and the argument that elections uh, were attempted to be influenced by various uh, Facebook posts and other stuff. Now, as of date, we have yet to see any evidence that there was any change in the US elections due to this. In fact, uh, the Deputy Attorney General in this particular indictment, speaking after that, has said that no Americans were involved, there is no payments that have been made to Americans, there doesn't seem to be any conspiracy, and also says that no change in the US elections took place, no voting change occurred. So if we take all of this, then what are we really discussing? DNC was hacked, servers were hacked, clearly. FBI did not do a forensic analysis of the hack. Mm -hmm. So we are only rely, relying on a company, which I think is called CrowdStrike, which is run by an ex-Ukrainian national. And 
maybe it's an Ukrainian attempt to change the US election results and its relationship with Russia, we don't know. But they are the ones who pronounced Russian hack. They are the ones who claim that there are all kinds of fingerprints of Russia. And that's a story which has been lifted lock, stock and barrel by everybody, including for what we can see these indictments. It also says that the DNC hack results went to organization one, which in this case is WikiLeaks, according to this. And we know, though it's not, uh, it has not been, uh, shall we say, officially announced that there is a grand jury indictment of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks is going to be dragged into this issue and that's why the naming of organization one. You know, if we look at whatever details we have of the DNC hack, one thing is very clear. The DNC servers were very poorly protected. It would be very surprising if a number of intelligence agencies, including that friendly to the United States, had not really looked into the DNC server, given the level of, shall we say, uh, ignorance the uh, Democratic uh, Party had about its uh, about right. its security, so why would then uh, why would Russia leave only unique fingerprints and nobody's fingerprints is there on that server? Is also for professional, shall we say? security experts very difficult to believe if you take the common belief in the community security community is that that was almost an open server yeah. to which anybody could hack into finding unique signatures of only russians and nobody else is a preposterous argument did the russians give this documents to wikileaks open question we will uh, we are unlikely to hear anybody say yes to that question and it is very unlikely that even if the Russians did give it, they would have given the documents to Julian Assange without, you know, hiding that they are doing it. A lot of arguments have been given that the Russians acted because they left signatures. Now we are in the uh, possession of NSA and CIA tools regarding hacking. One of the uh, set of tools that is there is to how to lead uh, leave forged signatures by which you can create signatures of other known uh, Russian hackers, yeah. Finnish hackers, German hackers. So you can f spoof your signature. That's also given, uh, are, is also available in this tool. So given this murky picture to say the Russian hacked is probably very difficult to establish and I don't think any of these indictments are going to come to court and it will be meaningful. And it's interesting that uh, the companies which were earlier indicted, there's a, there's a second set of indicted, indictments which have been handed down, they were expected not to contest it and we thought that nothing would come out of it. One of the Russian companies has hired lawyers to ask for discovery, show us the documents. And at the moment, the uh, Buller's investigation team, investigating or indicting team, has not furnished any documents. It will be interesting to see what, what's going to come out of it. But I find that the biggest fraud is not the indictments. I think that the biggest fraud on the people is the belief that while United States has the impunity to intervene in any elections, forget elections, even military interventions, like in Syria, like in Iraq, like in Libya, like in various other countries without the official sanction of the United Nations Security Council, which is the only international law which can allow it to so intervene in other countries, that it is talking about elections being hacked, which means it could be propaganda, it could be various other things, which most countries would accept is quasi-legitimate uh, uh, if other countries do try to change the elections in another country which is not favorable to it. I think this is the biggest fraud, that there is something called election hacking, uh, which R Russia does, and while US only does benign, uh, shall we say, uh, benedictions. Great. So uh, do you think this would specifically have any impact on the discussions per se, in terms of uh, any pressure being applied on Putin, or is Putin likely to just dismiss the whole issue as he has done before? I think Putin is going to say, hey, I'm not responsible for what is happening in your country. That's your problem, Mr. President Trump. The question is, will Trump be in a position to negotiate uh, too much without seeming to have given in to Putin and therefore the charge 
that Putin, he's Putin's some, uh, baby or he's Putin's tool. And I think that's really the uh, attempt that others are making, yes. that the attempt to circumscribe Trump's ability to reach any kind of normalization of relationship with Russia. And that's really the bigger game plan. Make it impossible to have the Rio Prochma, mm -hmm. in which case the war industry is happy, yes. various other bodies are happy. And it's interesting, or it's very strange in another way of looking at it, that the Democratic Party has emerged now as a major war party. Mm. So it's still, still the major hawk, sir? As much in the uh, Democratic Party also makes sense, right? This was not what should have been, could have been, would have been seen in the 60s, right. where the Republicans were the uh, hawk, hawkish party, and continuing with the Star Wars scenario, uh, Ronald Reagan right. wanting Star Wars, and so on. So this was the normal way of looking at war and, uh, shall we say, not so uh, rabid war. The Democrats were relatively more restrained on war than the Republicans were. But now we see, strangely enough, with Trump probably trying to have a more, uh, shall we say, US first could also be a more isolationist right. uh, agenda. That therefore the Democrats want this globalizing agenda and the globalization agenda seems to include war at all costs. So war has now become a part of the globalizing agenda right. and Trump who's otherwise much more right wing, white uh, supremacist, uh, are some of his best friends, shall we say, if he's not one himself, that all of this is also uh, anti-globalization in some ways, and therefore uh, they, he doesn't seem to be as much as eager to get into war, though we have Iran, right. we have Israel-Palestine issue in which Trump is as much of a hawk, if not more of a hawk, right. than the Democrats. So we have this uh, mix of, shall we say, hawk on some issues, uh, trying to reach an accommodation on some issues, while Democrats seem to be very much anti uh, any approachment to Russia and continuing to work on a policy of isolation with Russia, which is what uh, Obama did. Uh, but at the same time, uh, on say issues like Iran, they were probably not as hawkish. And certainly on the question of Israel, they, while supporting what Israel did, let's put it this way, Barack Obama was no great friend of Netanyahu, though he also ended up by supporting Israel right through. So actually, since we talked about globalization and war being a part of that perspective, Trump also attended the NATO meet where he created a lot of chaos. And incidentally, the interesting thing was that it was through basically demanding that all the other countries stick to their 2% of GDP targets for NATO and then increase it to 4% too. But at the same time, it basically created uh, huge rifts in the organization per se. So how do we see the future of an organization like NATO at a time when isolationist, say, right-wing governments are rising across Europe and there's a policy of every country looking, at the, looking after their interests first, as opposed to an earlier a phase of more collaboration in the field of defense? You know, the, here is Trump's uh, schizophrenia, if you will, that on one hand he says that he would like to have some agreement with uh, Russia. On the other hand, he's telling in the NATO discussion that Germany is, a, right. uh, is surrendering to Russia and uh, we are protecting Europe against Russia. So it's not clear in this discussion that he is able to reconcile his two uh, completely different positions. But that's the advantage Trump has. He's not trying to give you any coherent right. po position except that me, look at me, look at me. You know, so that's the position he is. He's, he's always at the center stage of outrageous statements and all of it means that Trump is always in the news. And that seems to be his, uh, his strategy. In the issue of NATO, the, again, it, the problem really goes back a long way. It's not Trump alone who is a, uh, is a consequence that has created this schizophrenia in the US policies. US policy is supposed to be against Soviet Union. So once the Soviet Union fell, the Cold War ended. NATO should have been wound up. And a lot of uh, leading geostrategic experts, uh, international relations experts said the time for NATO is over. Yeah. Let's have peace agreement with Russia. Yeltsin was 
more of a chamcha or a, shall we say an underling stooge of United States than anybody ever was, else was and he was willing to sell Russia completely to the Americans as long as they paid him enough money and supplied him good whiskey or good other drinks that he desired. Could have been even vodka. So he was really drunk right to his presidency. This is all the reports that we have. And he also sold off all Russia's assets at bargain basement pri prices to who later on emerges the oligarchs. Right. So you had a kleptocracy at a scale we had never seen before, with all of Russian assets being attempted to be really given over to the oligarchs. Now, this was the picture that was there. Why did you require the NATO? Uh, the NATO was also had promised that it will not come beyond Germany. It came right into the borders of Russia. It did not dismantle itself even after the fall of Soviet Union, the so-called Cold War had ended. It became a containment of China and Russia policy. And in this process, it demanded that it, it should really have more arms, it should do various things, it should maintain its military bases, it should do uh, various uh, war games right at the border of Russia and also have ABM batteries in the Baltic states and in Poland. Having done all of that, they are the ones who are creating this, shall we say, warmongering policies toward Russia. And now, of course, the, uh, Mr. Trump says, well, we are protecting against Russia. Now, this policy was not a European Union policy. It was really a, a US policy, which the Europeans have slavishly followed. There's no point in, in not pointing that out. But it has been a US policy all along. So now US is saying, we are still protecting you. Now you have to give us money. If we look at the scenario that there is really no major war threat from the, uh, from the Russians, even Ukraine, and we have discussed it earlier, this was really Russia's response in trying to detach Crimea, which was their military base, and take it out of their sphere of influence, and then bar them having an a, a access to a 20, 20, 12 months uh, right. port. So where you know, you're not frozen for part of the year. So this was the uh, scenario under which the Russians really responded the way it did. It was all provocation and all trying to encircle Russia, which was the NATO policy. And this NATO policy was the US policy. Therefore, the need for defense against Russia. But if this was never, if this was not the US policy, and this, as I said, was not a European Union policy, then the question of a defense treaty against Russia did not arise. Then what was the, def uh, what was the defense treaty for? So it had really two purposes. One is policing the world. Therefore, the uh, what is called the global war on terror. That was one part of it. Other is containment of Russia and China for essentially hegemonizing the world so that there should be no, what US strategic uh, term uses the word, revisionist powers. That anybody who challenges the hegemony of the United States will be a revisionist power and expecting the European to foot the bill for United States to be the global hegemon. This is really Trump's demand. While other presidents of the United States have seen that this is in US interest, therefore have not in, you know, insisted of so-called 4%, all of these figures, fancy figures Trump is uh, pulling out, but had said, okay, you guys should pay at least 2% while we'll fit the bigger bill. So the question that European powers have to ask, do they have an independent foreign policy? If their foreign policy is already sold to the United States, then of course it's a moot point that whether they can then say we don't need defense against Russia because they have then already decided their external enemies are only going to be decided by uh, the Americans. So that's a decision they need to take. It's a much, much bigger decision that they need to take, not about the budget. If, to sum up in one sentence, what we now have as Trump's demand for 2% or 4%, it doesn't really matter. Germany has a defense budget of 1.1% and it wants peace. So therefore, the argument that the budget should be increased is an extortionist demand. We will protect you, you pay us the money through your budget. Trump is seeking for net transfers, not to NATO, but to 
United States. States. And this is also the transfer they're seeking in their various trade deals. And that also has European Union and even Canada as a target, not just China. So what we are seeing now is the United States, and we have discussed this earlier, the United States attempt to leverage its military strength into economic tribute. Right. So the classic case of the big bully with the big stick now demanding money because that's the only uh, currency of power that the United States has left with this declining, declining economy. And that's where this issue becomes important that the US is still the preeminent global military power and it's bigger as we know than all the other countries put together in military terms. Its budget, just the increase of this year's budget is more than Russia's annual military budget. So it's about 10%. Russia is really 10% of the US military budget. In fact, even Saudi Arabia has a bigger budget than Russia has. So these are not comparable issues at all. They are bargaining their military strength now into tribute. And that's what the demand to European Union is, that pay me tribute. Thank you, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching NewsClick.